Hello. All right. Um, so I'm going to take a brief detour away from stars for a bit uh, to talk about exoplanets. Uh, one, because exoplanets are awesome. Two, because uh, a lot of the methods for detect detecting exoplanets relate very closely to some of the methods of um, looking at stars, particularly binary star systems um, from the last video. Okay, so uh, as we saw, you can look at the spectrum of a star. Um, and that'll give you an idea of its motion towards or away from you. This is showing uh, if the top is an object that is not moving with respect to you. Uh, the bottom one is something that's moving away from you. It's like it's redshifted. Um, so we saw this in, in binary star systems. Um, so the light from one star, um, I think in this case, uh, one star is overwhelming. No. Um, yeah, so the two stars, one is redshifting when it's coming towards you. Excuse me. One is redshifting when it's moving away from you. The other one is blue shifting at that time and vice versa. So you see these red and blue shifts happening um, for, with, from these two stars going around each other. In the case of an exoplanet, where an exoplanet is a planet orbiting a star other than our sun, so in other star systems, uh, planetary systems, um, what we see is that a planet, um, which is super, super tiny and super, super dim compared to the star, so we don't, vast majority of the times we cannot detect it with our telescope, um, it's still exerting a gravitational pull on the star, making the star move in a little orbit of its own. Sometimes the orbit is so tiny, it really is just kind of wobbling around. Um, and so you might hear this as the, you know, people refer to this as the wobble of the star um, due to the planets pulling on it. What that does is when you get the light from the star, sometimes the light is redshifted because the star is moving away from you in its orbit, sometimes it's blue shifted. Um, and so what we actually measure is the um, motion of the star, which can then be inferred to be from a planet. So um, this was called the, we talked about this as the spectroscopic binary stars. For this, it's called the Doppler method or the wobble method or the radial velocity method. Um, what you observe over time, so time is your x-axis here, velocity or the speed and direction um, is what's shown on the y-axis. Um, I think positive is moving away and negative is moving towards. Um, this is the, the red shift is how much it shifts from its original position in the spectrum, that particular line. From that, you can figure out the velocity. And then again, red shifted is away, blue shifted is towards, so that tells you if it's positive or negative. What you see is that red shift or blue shift changing with time. So the speed of the star is changing with this very, um, well, in this case, very nice, simple little pattern uh, in this example. And you can use that to figure out the period of the star, uh, the period of the star going around once. Period of the star going around once is the same as the period of the planet going around the star once. So that gives you the period of that exoplanet. Um, you can go back and use Kepler's third law, uh, if you remember that, from the period and knowing the mass of the star, which you can usually estimate by comparing it to similar stars, um, that will tell you how far the planet is from um, its star. Also, because gravity is involved, you can make an estimate of the mass of the planet. So you get a bunch of different things from this method. Um, the period, which gives you this, the um, average distance from the star, uh, and you get a handle on its mass. The other type of binary stars um, we talked to that you can't see the two stars directly is an eclipsing binary, um, where the stars, you know, sometimes you're seeing the combined light of both stars sometimes, so it's a certain brightness, but when one goes in front of the other, you lose some of that brightness, you get a dip. So just as you have eclipsing binaries, um, you can have this with planets going around their stars as well. In this case, we call it a transit. Um, the, the light from the planet is so, 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 so 
tiny compared to the light from the star um, that you don't always see the second dip, but you can see when the planet goes in front of the star, the brightness of that star dims, your apparent brightness dims, um, because you are blocking some of that light from the planet. Um, so this transit method, um, you, by watching it l over a long enough time, you can get the period of the, the planet that tells you it's rough, uh, tells you its average distance from its star. Um, but because the transit depends on how, you know, big the planet is and how much light it blocks, it gives you a sense of the radius of the planet, the size of the planet, its diameter. Um, so something to note, these two different methods, one gives you a handle on the mass, the other gives you a handle on its physical size, its radius. Um, so you really need both if you want to get mass and size and then figure out the density of the planet. Um, so these two can work in tandem. The transit method has been used by the Kepler Space Telescope, which you may have heard of if you follow astronomy news. Um, the Kepler Space Telescope, um, basically they stared at, at a specific piece of sky, measuring the brightness of a whole bunch of stars in this particular star field. Um, and measuring all those stars at the same time, uh, you, they were able to figure out, you know, to see which ones were dimming um, and figure out which ones are likely um, due to planets. So thousands and thousands of exoplanets have been detected using this transit method. Um, it often has to be followed up with observations from ground-based telescopes, um, but Kepler was, was um, super, super, super productive in terms of bringing forth these planets. So this one, this graphic says they were 2,662 confirmed exoplanets um, that came out of this mission. The next generation of that, the mission uh, that is in orbit right now, is called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's also using the transit method, it's in the name, um, but instead of staring at one piece of sky uh, for several years looking for these dips, it's actually um, surveying the whole sky. So it's not looking at star, it's not picking up, I'm trying to think the best way to say it. It's not picking up um, all the, you know, it's not going to pick up all the super small planets. It's not going to pick up the faintest sources, but it's going to look around the whole sky. Um, and actually, um, so at the, at the point when this graphic was made in January, um, there's 37 planets, confirmed planets that came from that. Um, I have a link to the Exoplanet Archive here because I like to check whenever I'm doing this um, particular lecture because the number of exoplanets changes so rapidly um, because of these great discovery tools. Uh, I like to check this at website because it'll tell you. Um, so this is from like a little while ago. A um, couple, couple weeks, week and a half, um, that at that time there were 4,183 confirmed um, exoplanets that have been discovered. Um, 55 of them came from tests, so that's already more than January. Um, there's a bunch more that are candidates, so they have to follow up observations to see if they're actually planets or if there are other regions, uh, reasons why these, these stars are dimming. Another cool feature of this site is you can make your own graphs, that's what's kind of scrolling behind me here, um, of exoplanet properties. So I like to do that every once in a while. So this was from a little bit ago. This may have been 2019 when I made this plot. Um, this is, uh, you can get a sense of what exoplanets are like in general by looking at this, this large sample. Um, so this is showing from all the confirmed exoplanets, the time that I made this graph, um, the x-axis is its semi-major axis, which as you remember is the average distance from its star. It's in astronomical units. It's also a logarithmic, so I'll point out what that's like um, in our solar system. The y-axis is the eccentricity. Now, if you plotted our planets, uh, planets in our solar system on this plot, 
these arrows are pointing to roughly where they would be. So Mercury, you see Mercury, it has a slightly elliptical orbit. Um, Earth has, uh, has a, a very close to circular orbit. It's a little bit further out. Saturn, Neptune, on this logarithmic plot, they look like they're all kind of lined up. Um, so notice that 10 to the zero, that is one astronomical unit. 10 to the one, that's 10 astronomical units. 10 to the two is 100 astronomical units. This logarithmic plot um, is a little weird to think of that way. Um, so that's what the, our solar system would look like on this plot. Um, so you notice some characteristics. Um, first of all, you notice there are a lot more planets that are in really eccentric orbits. Um, so the neat solar system that we have, where Mercury's is a little elliptical, but all the rest are pretty close to circular, um, isn't necessarily copied throughout the galaxy. There are a lot of systems with very elliptical orbits, uh, planets in very elliptical orbits. Other thing you'll notice um, is that a lot of these planets are even closer to their star than Mercury is to our sun. Um, and if you know anything about Mercury, you know it's super, super hot. Um, the face side of it facing the sun is super, super hot um, because it is so much closer to the sun than we are. Um, these, some of these planets orbit their stars in mere days because they are so close to their stars. Um, this isn't surprising that we have so many there. Um, doesn't necessarily mean most planets are close to their stars. That is an example of uh, an observational bias. If you go back to the beginning, we talked about methods of science and biases. Um, it's going to be easier to detect a planet that is close to its star because it has a short period, so you can see it orbit many, many times to be really sure of it. Um, if you're using the Doppler method, it's going to pull on the star more when it's closer, gravity's stronger, so it's going to make that wobble more obvious. Um, and I don't think there's a, other than the period, I don't think there's a significant advantage to the transit, but I could be wrong. But anyway, there are um, reasons why it's easier to detect those planets. In fact, those, the first exoplanets were detected around sun-like stars were like s Jupiter sized, super close to their star. So it made a big wobble. Um, so our solar system is not uh, necessarily typical of the systems that we see out there. Um, Oh, that's why I, that's why I just covered that. Sorry. Why do they think we have found more planets that are closer to their stars? <laughs> it's observational bias is a large part of it. Um, so this is an artist's conception of, of a hot Jupiter. Um, many of the first exoplanets were these gas giants super close to their stars. Um, they probably didn't form there. Uh, we didn't, we're not talking about planetary formation in this course. Um, but uh, it's expected that large gas giants can only form further out away from their stars where it's a lot colder. Um, so when, <laughs> when observational astronomers started detecting all these gas giants super close to stars, the theorists were like, oh, this is new, um, and eventually figured out a model of uh, planetary migration where these large planets um, probably formed further out, but came in. So you've got planets moving through solar systems. You've got really elliptical orbits. Things are a bit more chaotic in a lot of these other systems than they are in our solar system. Um, this Kepler graph is a bit old now, but it still gets across the point um, that the sizes of the planets that are detected um, also show us something interesting. At the top, it's got the sizes of Mars, Venus and Earth, so we're like the super tiny, uh, dense, rocky planets. And then further out, you've got um, the larger, fluffier gas giants. Um, Neptune and Uranus are gas and ice, and Jupiter and Saturn are gas. Um, there's nothing in between, you know, Earth-sized and Neptune-sized in our solar system. But what astronomers have seen is that there are a lot of planets in that size range in the systems that they're detecting. So ones that are a bit bigger than Earth tend to call super Earths. The ones that are a bit smaller than Neptune are called mini Neptunes or sub Neptunes. Um, so there's a lot of uh, planet sizes that are created in these other systems that just didn't happen to be created in our system. Um, if you read along with the book, 
definitely encourage you to check out some of the cool pretty images. Um, in very, very, very few cases um, are exoplanets detectable, usually with infrared telescopes and some method of blocking the star's light. Um, but you also need uh, something to keep in mind, really good resolution, right? So go back to that telescope section we talked about um, shorter wavelength and larger telescopes give you better angular resolution, so finer detail. You need really fine detail to, to see one of these um, or to see say two double stars, uh, sorry, two stars in a binary orbiting each other or to detect the parallax because that's a tiny motion. You really need that high angular resolution. Okay, highlights from this. Uh, extrasolar planets or exoplanets are detected um, with same, some of the same methods that binary stars were detected with. Um, instead of eclipsing, you have transiting, same thing. Doppler slash radial method um, for detecting exoplanets. The Doppler method measures the motion of the star with redshift and blue shift. Um, as the exoplanet orbits, tells you the mass, gives you an idea of the mass. The transit method is the planet going in front of the star, gives you an idea of its physical size or radius. Um, and the most easily detected systems, the ones that were detected first, um, in the mid late nineties, um, those tended to have really small orbits. So really short periods, um, and really massive exoplanets. But again, that is in large part an observational bias as the technology gets better, uh, astronomers can make a more complete picture of what the size distributions and distance distributions are really like, um, throughout the galaxy. Um, exoplanet systems vary pretty wildly from each other and from our solar system. So our solar system is, is the only example we've been able to study up until the 90s. Um, and all of these other systems that are being discovered and studied uh, show us that ours may be unusual in its stability. All right, that's it on exoplanets. I will see you next time.